who's the state director of Americans for Prosperity West Virginia. He listened intently yesterday as the governor gave his state of the state address, his seventh, with uh, one to go. Jason, good morning. How are you, sir? I'm fantastic, Rob. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> I took some notes yesterday while the gov was doing his thing, right? So the first thing was the speech was to start at 7, and it started at 7.13. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but I think his explanation was he forgot his speech. I think uh, I think Kathy had it. As well. Kathy had <laughs> it? That's my understanding. That's what he said at the beginning. Yeah, so they, they couldn't find the speech for a while, so he got started at 7.13. He ended at 8.30. Around 728, he kind of got started, and he made reference to the fact that at one time in West Virginia, we actually celebrated an opening of a Taco Bell in Charleston. Now, I assume he meant as economic development as opposed to he really likes Taco Bell and likes to head on down there <laughs> for a quick snack. <laughs> that's well, what, if you that's remember back in, the, uh, back in the Earl Ray Tomlin days, um, a big announcement would be like, hey, we added 25 jobs here. I do know that, yes. Yeah. I distinctly remember that and being shocked by uh, by Governor Tomlin at the time, thinking that was really good for us. I remember uh, those I, press I releases. Was, I thought it was bad. <laughs> so the the governor, and, and it was the 745 that he brought this out. He called it the Justice Cannonball, and he makes a big splash. And he said he's a West Virginia tsunami, right? 50% personal income tax cut proposed, introduced over three years 30% the first year, the next 10% the second year, the next 10% the year after that. What did you think about that? Well, you know, Rob, I think uh, obviously if, if you know anything about Americans for Prosperity, that was music to my ears, right? And I, I think really what the governor was calling for, reading between the lines, is, is unity between the legislature, um, House, Senate, and governor getting together and really uh, not wasting what is a historic opportunity with, with the budget surplus we have, right? I mean, for the last several years, uh, lawmakers have enacted pro-growth policies, and, and we're starting to see that bear fruit in a big way. They've also been very fiscally responsible. They've, they've held themselves to flat budgets. Um, and what essentially the, 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 the force of the work behind that, why they wanted to have flat budgets, it's so that they could eventually return money to taxpayers. Because what we know is all the states that have done responsible um, prudent tax cuts. Um, they have come out on top in terms of economic growth, creating jobs, and generally letting folks invest in their livelihoods and their lives. Jason, after that, he then mentioned the fact that he had proposed uh, a workaround previously to the personal property tax. And I'm wondering if you think there's any appetite for that from the governor's office, the House, I know the Senate's very interested in that as well. Well, Rob, here's 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 my take on all that. And as someone who worked very hard on on the amendments that were on the ballot uh, this this previous election cycle um, to try to get those passed, um, so that we could have the constitutional authority to to take a crack at tangible personal property tax. Listen, we lost. We lost pretty heavily. Uh, justice whooped us, and uh, I'll be the first one to admit that. You know, and you know, I think. At the end of the day, I'm not sure that we, we have the authority to make changes to tangible personal property in that way. Uh, I'm, I'm almost certain there'll be a court challenge on it. Um, but, you know, really, I think when it comes to sort of a rebate scheme, states have tried that before. Uh, it's, it's kind of a nothing burger. Like, it's not going to do a whole lot uh, in terms of the economic impact that, that folks want to see. And that's why I think instead we've, we've got to really focus in on the personal income tax uh, because it's something that constitutionally, A, we can do. B, is, is a proven metric by which to grow your economy and increase the prosperity of the individual person. Um, and it's, I mean, you know, everybody's been talking about cutting taxes for decades and decades. Back when I was with the, the state Republican Party even, um, before Republicans took the majority, they campaigned on cutting taxes. And guess what? We haven't seen it yet. We've seen them raise some taxes when times were tough. I don't know if you remember when they raised the cigarette tax or yes, when they raised the gas tax. Um, but, you know, we've never seen them cut taxes. And this is the moment. This is their moment to make up for not meeting the, the mandate of that promise yet. And it's a perfect opportunity because they can do it in a fiscally responsible fashion uh, because they planned ahead. They planned ahead um, being fiscally restrained for this moment to happen. 
He also mentioned a one-time bonus payment of fifteen hundred dollars for some retirees. I didn't, I didn't get the the entire uh, bit of detail on that one. Do you know anything more about that, Jason? Uh, I, I know what you know. I've got some notes jotted down here, but you know, classic Jim Justice fashion. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. He said what he said, and we'll find out later to the extent that you know what what exactly what exactly what we're talking about. Uh, but that's you know that's typical with policymakers, right? Especially when you got a guy that's passionate. Um, they're like really excited about what they're talking about, um, and so, yeah. I mean, listen uh, for the folks that that are out there that are uh, sort of advocating against cutting taxes, any kind of tax, and, and you know, you know the folks I'm talking about. Um, their thought process is essentially: we have this fixed pie, and there's only so much money to go around. And guess what? There are priorities that they want to to fund uh, with all of the surplus dollars. And if it was up to the tax and spend crowd, they would use all of that money, uh, not not put it back in the pockets of, of West Virginians. And uh, we would have a situation where, guess what, you know, we're out of money and the economy is not growing. And so I think lawmakers are making a very prudent and, and thoughtful analysis of this situation. And frankly, it's, it's to be commended, right? Um, you know, you could have a situation where, like in Washington, D.C., and, and like in tax and spend states, that folks are leaving because uh, their tax rates are too high. You know, lawmakers here instead said, you know what, let's not let's not blow all this money on a pet project. Instead, let's let's put it back into the pockets of West Virginians and let them invest uh, in their lives. And because we know that's a that is a metric that moves the economy forward and it gives people opportunities. So very, uh, very heartening. John. Well, first of all, I don't know if you see the TV feed for this show or not, but you have the coolest James Bond publicity yes. photo that I've ever seen on, totally. on this station. It's, so congratulations <laughs> on that. Um, and the Leonardo DiCaprio photo is yes. just like paying dividends. <laughs> I'm never getting rid of that thing. <laughs> yes, I, we commented on that in a previous appearance. And, and in the comment section, they said, Rob has a man crush on Jason. I have to admit it's true. That is a total James Bond photo. <laughs> it is. It really is. Yeah. Uh, so congratulations on that. Uh, but I do have that tuxedo little, little jacket. Little bromance. Little bromance. <laughs> <you know. laughs> Nothing wrong with that. This is the this is 21st century. Um, okay, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit. There are, in, in doing prep for this show, I was doing some research, and, and there are a, a number of folks who say that this surplus we have is a bogus surplus, that it, it's it's a creation of um, low-balling expected tax revenues and not providing services. So then when we hear just today on the on news broadcast, I hear that we're over a thousand correctional officers short. Uh, Governor Justice was talking about the problems we have with nursing. We're talking about location pay. We're talking about you know a lot of issues that face the state of West Virginia. Um, couldn't a lot of those actually be solved by taking those the 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 surplus and just putting it to use? Well, I think that um, in the short term, sure. But in the long term, you have to think about the opportunity costs that we have in front of us, right? Uh, to some extent, we we have priorities, obviously, that government should fund, genuine funding priorities. Um, what we have to do is grow our economic pie so as those funding priorities grow. Uh, right now, we're on a path for things to just be insolvent at some point, right? So we've got to find a way to incentivize people to come to our state to grow our economy. Um, to create jobs and opportunity for people. You know, I used to jokingly say that the largest population center of West Virginia was like Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I said that tongue in cheek, but really, we've had so many people that have fled the state because of a lack of opportunity. And now you're starting to see individuals say, hey, maybe it's time to get back home because things are looking a little brighter. We've done a lot of work to break down sort of barriers between folks and, and employment, uh, folks being able to have a job and have that sort of employment mobility that they want. And, you know, in the long term, what we've got to do is focus in on growing that economic pie. And, and one of the ways you do that is, is through tax reform. Look at what happened in, say, like North Carolina, right? Everybody said the same thing down there, um, you know. You shouldn't use your, your surpluses to, to do tax cuts. It's not going to work. And guess what? They've got more revenue now because they've, they have grown um, their economic pie. And so I think for us to be able to shore up the, the priorities, the genuine funding priorities of the state in the long term, especially as our state grows, um, we're going to need to provide folks with that incentive to come here. Because if you remember, we have the 17th highest top marginal tax rate in the country. 
um, at 6.5%. We have the 14th highest second top marginal rate in the country. We are wildly out of step because that is a holdover from West Virginia's tax that's been passed. We pay more than everybody in all the states surrounding us, even Maryland. And so we are we are just not competitive. And as states continue to cut taxes across the country, we're going to become even less competitive. So we've got to do something right now. The Maryland thing, by the way, if I can butt in here for a moment, uh, is a bit misleading, though, Jason, because Maryland has a county piggyback tax that goes on top of the state income tax rate. So, for instance, you, you mentioned that 5.75 was the top rate. But you can get dinged with another, depending on what the rate is in your county, another 1% or 1.5% or, or, or 2% on top of that. So yeah, they, and Pennsylvania does the same thing, yeah, which yeah. I think is a, is, is a benefit for us that we don't have any kind of county income tax um, set up in the state. Hopefully to God we never do. But in any event, you know, I, I think it's, it's just a boon for us, right? It's even much, that much more of an incentive to say, hey, you know, if, if I could live over there, maybe I could save some considerable money. Yeah. So looking at uh, the governor's proposals from last night and the 486 bills, <clears throat> excuse me, they were introduced in the House yesterday and 126 plus 23 in the Senate yesterday. When you look at, at the slate of, of proposals that are out there, where do you see the biggest job building opportunities? Well, and that's, that's a really good question because we can't look at things in a, in a policy vacuum. Folks tend to get kind of fixated on this thing or that thing, and we have to remind ourselves that all of these things that are being adopted policy-wise, you know, they're, they're affecting West Virginia in, in a simultaneous fashion, right? And so kind of like what I was talking about at the beginning of the show is you know, all of these policies that we've adopted throughout the years – um, that we know are pro-growth, that we know will help grow the economy, create jobs, uh, generally just help people thrive as individuals. You know, the, the mentality of the legislature has been make West Virginia a better place to live, work, and raise a family. Um, and so that's a great mantra to have. Guess what? It's working, uh, as we can see, and we want to supercharge and double down on that effect. Uh, so, you know, really, I mean, if you look at, for instance, like our legislative agenda that, that we have put out and we've, we've put out the pathway to prosperity from Americans for Prosperity, uh, you know, since 2016, uh, a lot of that, a lot of that checklist over the years, if you, if you look at, uh, the progress we've had has been done, but there's so much more that we can do, uh, just in terms of, you know, cutting red tape that folks face, uh, particularly when it comes to occupational licensure, we're way out of step. Uh, with other states, uh, we we build a, a bunch of red tape barriers from professionals being able to come to West Virginia because they start from scratch, as opposed to being recognized as professionals who who have worked for uh, many years in a profession. You know, so we can en we can enact the Universal Recognition of Licensure Act. Uh, that's something that has come up, and I think would would you know when Arizona passed a similar law, and, you know, they had five thousand highly trained professionals, mostly medical folks, move to their state. That's a that's a neat area for us, uh, but our our number one is going to remain uh, making sure this personal income tax is is reduced significantly because the state has the money to do it, and if not now, when? So I'm relatively new to the state here, and it seems to me was was there a, is there a history in West Virginia of legislation that was specifically designed to keep foreigners out? Foreigners being everyone who is not West Virginian, or is, is it just yes. okay? Yes. I mean, well, if you just think about, okay, and this is not a partisan statement by any means, but any time a civil party rules something for 100 years, chances are um, they are doing some, some backdoor dealing with their friends that helps their friends. And we had uh, just a ton of barriers built up. You know, we were not a right-to-work state. Um, we had a prevailing wage system that did not function properly and was costing taxpayers more for infrastructure than, than what they needed to pay. So our infrastructure wasn't great. Um, again, you know, we haven't fixed the licensure problem yet. You know, the the special interests can hire a lobbyist to go into Charleston and, and you know, erect a barrier uh, to market entrance coming into a particular profession. The average person doesn't have that luxury, right? So really, at Americans for Prosperity, what we do is, is find proven policies um, to advance the, the prosperity of an individual uh, and enact those policies in a, in a rapid way. And so, yeah, we, we've We've identified a lot of areas, but again, there's a lot of areas that, that West Virginia can continue to grow, uh, particularly, like I said, when it comes to, to red tape. And, and lawmakers have done a lot of great work on that thus far. Um, you know, we've done a lot of advancement in terms of our health care in the state. 
Uh, we have one of the one of the better telemedicine laws in the state that allows folks to be able to access health care through their phone um, and, you know, uh, gen- generally have broken down a lot of scope of practice barriers because um, what it used to be. And anytime you talk health care, it's a turf war between uh, professions, but usually doctors and nurses, to be frank. But um, <laughs> we've broken down a lot of barriers that that practitioners faced, uh, APRNs, um, you know, physicians' assistants, so that they can practice to their full extent of their training. And that's a that's a huge thing for access to care and also the affordability of care. So, Jason Huffman is our guest. He is the State Director of Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia Chapter. Jason, as you look at this upcoming session, uh, what else otherwise can this state do from a tax reform standpoint to make it a more livable place? In the past, we've discussed how West Virginia treats professionals and the licensing and such, which seems to be a bit overbearing in West Virginia compared to surrounding states. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as we've discussed, right, we're where we are an outlier in terms of rates. We need to look at that in a hard way. And I think, you know, for the folks out there that that and we were we were some of the folks that focused on tangible personal property and, and gaining the constitutional authority through the amendment process to change that. Um, well, we're not in a situation to do that. So we've got to now refocus our attention on the things that we can have a meaningful transformational impact on. And for me, that's the income tax. You know, the states, if you look at the states, you know, I think the figure is something like 24 of the 25, you know, highest tax states have seen people leave. Uh, and those folks have gone to low tax states. Uh, people are voting with their feet when it comes to what is coming out of their pocket, you know, money that they've earned, uh, hard earned sometimes, and what they're allowed to keep. And so we can incentivize people to come here. I think that, that Governor Justice is exactly right in terms of, you know, <laughs> lawmakers have said, let's not middle with the, with the edges of trying to do something in, in personal income tax. Let's do something big, bold, transformational. And, you know, my hope and our activists hope, and, you know, we're going to be going door to door and talking to folks because that's that's what we do. Um, I hope that lawmakers will come together on something that is truly transformational for the state. And, and finally, you know, have that promise come to fruition that they've made for years. Part of the governor's speech last night had to do with the 50 percent income tax cut that he's calling for. The other part had to do with how he wants to allocate some of the rest of the money, $40 million for hospitals, $37 million for the school aid formula with a first-grade concentration, if I had that correct, $10 million for the Posey Perry Emergency Food Bank Fund. There are $677 million in ARPA funds that need to be allocated. He wanted $500 million for an economic impact fund and $177 million to fund water and sewer projects. He called for a 5% pay raise for all state employees, $100 million into the PEIA, as in Save the PEIA Fund, $15 million for the Hope Scholarship, $75 million in higher ed for building maintenance, $1 million for the Child Pregnancy Center, $20 million, I think that was for nursing programs, uh, $10 uh, $10 million for the EMS Fund, uh, $5,000 incentive to veterans who want to move back to West Virginia. A uh, million dollars to Marshall University for an economic development uh, African-American community fund. Uh, and he noted that uh, we need to put more money into tourism uh, because uh, the state spent five, uh, received $5 billion in uh, spending last year from tourists. And also talked about a program for uh, getting all the state's labs under one roof, which would be $250 million. He wanted to spend $125 million on that this year and $125 million on that next year. And there's still roughly uh, $450 more million dollars to spend for broadband around the state. So it's a lot of spending, too, Jason. Yeah, certainly. And, I, you know, I don't have details on, on all those particular policies. Um, the, the thing that sort of comes to mind is if your economy is growing, you, you can fund priorities. Um, what those priorities are is up to the, obviously, deliberative process of, of the legislature and, and the governor and his budget and, and how they interact with that budget. Um, and, you know, I would I would encourage folks to reach out to their lawmakers to say, hey, um, you know, we want to make sure that you're continuing to be fiscally responsible, which um, the governor also said he's going to have a, a rel- relatively, quote, relatively flat budget, which is important for uh, the ability to cut income tax. And so, you know, as we continue to grow as a state, um, 
you're going to have situations where we have the money to do things that maybe aren't a priority. And so I would I would caution folks about that. But as to the, the details of all those things, um, I don't have them in front of me. Um, and I don't think anybody does necessarily unless the bills have been put in the system this morning for the governor's office. So uh, in any event, I think, uh, again, it's just a, a word of caution as we as we continue to grow as a state to, to continue to have that fiscally responsible mindset and you know, ask yourself, just because we can fund a thing, should we fund it? Is it the proper role of government? Um, is it something that government should be doing? John, final question or comment for Jason? Well, just, I think it was in 2008. Um, memory is, is a little foggy on this, but we distributed a lot of funds out to the American people at, at, the, at the federal level, the national level. And the big shock was that people got all this money and then they didn't actually spend it on cars and burgers and so they, they put it into their savings accounts. So the net effect on growing the economy was negligible. Um, I'm wondering, you know, it's always, you never know, right? This is all a big poker game. So you never know what people are going to do with that income tax. You know, ideally they take all, t- you know, f- whatever it is their, their extra cash is and they go and they buy stuff with it. I, I wonder if that's really what's going to happen. Well, I think if I remember that one correctly, that was, that was more of like a real one-time rebate thing, right? Mm-hmm. And I, mm-hmm. I would equate what we're, what we're talking about at the state level here. And again, that's that's almost like a macroeconomic versus microeconomic sort of uh, sort of. And that's what we're all but, about here. <laughs> right, 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 yes. right. But what I, what I would say, more, I would say more so what we want to see in West Virginia, I think what, what Governor Justice and many lawmakers are talking about is is more closely aligned to what President Trump did with the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where they took a, a holistic approach, but they went hard into um, certain tax areas that we knew would create growth um, like they they lowered the corporate rate um, so that we were competitive with many other countries that we were not competitive with they eliminated an entire bottom bracket uh, in their in their personal income tax scheme and lowered the rates and I remember there being a sort of a calculator that folks could type in you know here's here's how much you'll save as a person um, on your income tax through the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And oftentimes it was significant dollars all across every tax bracket. And so when you cut everybody's taxes into perpetuity, because um, guess what? If you cut taxes, it's going to be hard to undo that tax cut. Uh, although I, I know Democrats in Washington are trying to undo Trump's tax cut right now. Um, but in any event, uh, that is a different mental model, I think, for people because they go, this isn't a one-time thing. I've just got a pay raise. Uh, and when inflation's at nine percent, like it is right now, I think that folks are hurting. They're hurting with gas pumps. They are they are hurting the grocery store. Um, President Biden's failed fiscal policies have put us in a position to where you know out of control spending in Washington has driven inflation to this historic point. Um, and and frankly, West Virginians need relief from taxes more now than ever. So I I don't I don't foresee folks. Uh, I mean, maybe some folks will save, but guess what? That's if that's their version of the American dream and they're able to invest more in that. Great. That's good. But what we want to see is people move here so they can be part of West Virginia. And I think that's how we get there. Jason, thanks so much for your time this morning. As always, very much appreciated.